and welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 2. In the last video, we talked about phase diagrams, and today I want to tell you about one of the most useful things we can do with the information we get from a phase diagram. To begin, let's look at a specific example. Here's the phase diagram for water. If you look at this horizontal line, you can see that it's for a pressure of one atmosphere. If we start on the left, we're at a low temperature, so we start out in the solid phase, where we have ice. As we go to the right, the temperature increases until we cross this line, and the phase becomes liquid. As you already know, for water, this happens at zero degrees Celsius. We mentioned in the last video that when the phase changes, we can write this process as though it were a chemical reaction. So, for example, here's the reaction that occurs when we melt the ice to get liquid water. Like all reactions, this one has an enthalpy. In this case, it's 6.015 kilojoules per mole. Notice that the enthalpy is a positive number because we have to put heat into the ice in order to melt it. Anyway, back to the phase diagram. If we continue to go to the right, the temperature increases again until we get to the next phase change. At this point, the water is vaporized and it becomes a gas. As you already know, this happens at the boiling point of water, which is 100 degrees Celsius. Once again, we can write this phase change like a chemical reaction, and this one has an enthalpy of 40.67 kilojoules per mole. We can continue to increase the temperature of our water vapor, which means we'll keep going to the right on the phase diagram. Another helpful way we can show this process is using what's called a heating curve. A heating curve is just a graph that shows how the temperature of a substance changes with time. We have the temperature on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So, for example, suppose we start with a sample of ice and we start to heat it. The temperature will increase for a while until eventually we reach zero degrees. At that point, the ice starts to melt. But remember, this process is like a chemical reaction and it has a positive enthalpy. That means we have to put heat into the reaction in order to make it happen. So the heat that we're putting into the ice gets used to perform the reaction. Up till now, the heat we put in caused the temperature to rise, but now our heat's making the ice melt instead. In the meantime, the temperature stops rising, and it just stays at zero degrees. The temperature stays at zero until all the ice finally melts, and then the temperature starts to rise again. The water is a liquid now, and its temperature rises until we eventually reach the boiling point, which is 100 degrees. Once again, we're now going to perform a reaction, so the heat we add will be used to supply the enthalpy change we need for that reaction. The temperature won't rise again until the water has been changed into water vapor. Once that process is finished, the temperature begins to rise again, and it'll continue until we stop heating the gas. So, what can we do with that information? Plenty. For instance, suppose we have 40 grams of ice at negative 20 degrees Celsius, and we want to heat it until it's a gas at 120 degrees. How much heat will that take? To find out, we can use a heating curve like this one. As you can see, the graph has five different sections, one where we heat the ice, one where the ice melts, and three more where the water's heated the water boils, and the water vapor is heated. We can figure out the amount of heat it takes for each of these steps, and then add them together to get the overall heat. Here's how we do that. Let's take this first step. We have 40.0 grams of ice, and we heat it from negative 20.0 degrees to zero degrees. You actually already know how to figure out the amount of heat this takes. Way back in General Chemistry 1, you learned about calorimetry, and you solve this equation. If you've forgotten about this, you might want to look back at video 15 of my videos for General Chemistry 1. Anyway, if we fill in the data for this equation, we'll know the enthalpy we need for that first step in our heating curve. M is the mass, which is 40.0 grams. C is the specific heat capacity. That's something we need to look up in a table. The specific heat capacities of ice, water, and water vapor are all in Appendix B of our textbook. 
If you look up the data for ice, you'll see that it's 2.09 joules per gram degree Celsius. And finally, delta T is the change in the temperature, which is 20.0 degrees. If you perform this calculation, you'll see that grams and degrees Celsius both cancel out, so our unit will just be joules, and we get 1,672 joules. Okay, now on to the second part of our heating curve. This flat area is where we melt the ice. We actually already know the enthalpy of this step. It's the enthalpy of this reaction, which is 6.015 kilojoules per mole. All we need to do is figure out how many moles we have. We have 40.0 grams, and if we use the periodic table, we find out that that's 2.22 moles of water. So that gives us 13.36 kilojoules for the enthalpy. Next, we'll find the enthalpy for the third step in the heating curve. This is a lot like the first step we did. We're increasing the temperature of the water, so we can use this formula again. We know m, we haven't changed the mass, so it's still 40.0 grams. However, the specific heat capacity isn't the same as it was for ice. Liquid water, ice, and water vapor all have different heat capacities. If you check Appendix B, you'll see that the heat capacity for water is 4.184 joules per gram degree C. And finally, the temperature is rising from 0 degrees to 100, so delta T is 100 Celsius. That gives us an enthalpy of 16,720 joules for this step. For the fourth step, we're converting the water into water vapor. Just like step two, this is a reaction that has an enthalpy, in this case, 40.67 kilojoules per mole. We already calculated that we have 2.22 moles of water, so we'll use that and find out that this step has an enthalpy of 90.29 kilojoules. Finally, in our last step, we're heating the water vapor from 100 Celsius to 120 Celsius. This is another step where we can use the calorimetry formula. We have 40.0 grams of water vapor, and if we look up the specific heat capacity, we find out that it's 1.84 joules per gram degrees Celsius. The change in temperature is 20.0 degrees. That gives us 1,472 joules for the enthalpy of the final step. So now all we have to do is add together the enthalpies of all five steps. But be careful. Notice that we calculated steps 1, 3, and 5 in joules, but steps 2 and 4 are in kilojoules. We need to make sure all of them are the same unit before we add them. I'll go ahead and convert steps 1, 3, and 5 into kilojoules. Now that we did that, we'll add them together and find out that the total enthalpy is 123.51 kilojoules. So that's how much heat we have to add in order to make our ice go from negative 20 degrees Celsius all the way to water vapor at 120 Celsius. We'll have lots of practice using curves like this to solve problems in class and on the homework. But first, there are a few things to notice about problems like this. First, remember that you'll need to look up the melting and boiling points of the substance you're working with. In this example, it was 0 degrees and 100 degrees because our compound was water. But the examples you see in the homework and on tests probably will be something else. In our class, you'll always be given the melting or boiling points when you need them. Second, sometimes you don't actually need as much information as we had in the example we just did. For example, suppose you had a problem where you heat water from 30 degrees to 200 degrees. In that case, since you begin at 30 degrees, you're starting with liquid water. And that means your heating curve will look like this. You start by heating the liquid, then in the flat part the liquid vaporizes, and then the water vapor gets heated. So your calculation in this example will only have three parts, not five parts. That shows how important it is to keep track of the phases of your starting and ending points. 
For that reason, I really recommend that you draw a heating curve when you solve a problem like this. It makes solving them a lot easier. Finally, it's important to realize that these calculations also work if you're cooling the compound instead of heating it. For example, suppose we have hot water vapor at 200 degrees C and we cool it off until it's ice at negative 50 C. In that case, our curve would look like this. We're starting at the hot temperature, then cooling it until it becomes a liquid, then we cool the liquid until it freezes, and then cool the ice until we're at our final temperature. This kind of curve is called a cooling curve instead of a heating curve, but we still solve the problem the same way. Notice that in steps 1, 3, and 5, delta t will be a negative number this time because the temperature is going down. Also, remember that in steps 2 and 4, the reactions we're performing are the opposite of the ones we did when we were heating the water. That means that the enthalpies for the reactions will have the opposite sign. They'll be negative instead of positive. So, unlike what happened when we heated the compound, when we cool a compound instead, all the steps in the cooling curve have a negative enthalpy. Well, that's it for now. You might have noticed that in the past few videos, we just looked at single, pure compounds. What happens when we make things more realistic by combining two or more things together, like salt and water? We'll start looking at solutions like that in the next video, so I hope you'll join me for that one. Until then, have a good week!